Hello and welcome to another Science Book Club, the YouTube series nobody asked for, but I decided to make anyway. Joining me this week is Ben McAllister, a physics PhD student from the University of Western Australia. Ben, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. So Ben works in detecting dark matter. Can you, what is dark matter and how are you trying to detect it? Okay, what is dark matter is a big question, David, because the short answer is nobody really knows. There are multiple different theories Essentially, dark matter, the name is quite descriptive. It's invisible matter, so it has mass, but it doesn't really interact with light, so we can't see it, and it's all around us. It envelops the galaxy, the planet, us sitting here right now. It's passing right through our bodies as we sit here. We can't see, touch, or feel it, but we know it's there because of its gravitational interactions, so we know it has mass. We can see the way the dark matter in the galaxy affects all the other stuff that we can see. So we can see it pulling on things, we just can't see it. Yes, exactly. And we're trying to detect it in the lab here at UWA as part of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Engineered Quantum Systems that uh, David and I are both affiliated yeah, with. Yeah, I feel bad because I'm not repping Equus yeah. today. Mm -hmm. oh, well. Yeah, so we're interested in this particular dark matter candidate called an axion. So I mentioned before, nobody really knows what dark matter is. There are sort of different theories based on the things we do know about it, which is that it has mass and it doesn't interact with regular matter much at all. One of the best candidates is this particle called the axion, and if dark matter is made of axions, you can detect them in the lab by basically turning on a big strong magnet, and then if there are axions inside the magnet, they should convert into little flashes of light. And uh, then you can try and detect those flashes of light, and that's what we do. And so by big strong magnet, we're, how strong are we talking here? Okay, in uh, technical specs, we're talking 14 Tesla, which is incredibly strong. Um, um, so that that's what, large enough? So. MRI scanners are what, about seven Tesla? Yeah, yeah, and MRI. So they, and they're really strong, they pull chairs across the yeah, room. Yeah, a typical junkyard magnet that might pick up a car, might be a few Tesla, one, two, three Tesla. So it's like considerably stronger. So this will lift 14 cars. Or yeah, something like that, yeah. That's a strong <laughs> magnet. Okay, well, best of luck. I Thank you. I presume if you had detected anything, you wouldn't be telling me just yet. Yes, exactly. Ah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all under embargo, you know, you'll see me in Sweden accepting, accepting my prize. Yeah. And, well, other prizes and things. You've got a podcast coming up. Can you? Would you like to talk a bit about that? I do. So I make podcasts with what is called the Curio Network. It's an independent podcast network, uh, sort of Australia-wide. There's a few people around the country working on it. Um, well, by the time you hear this, it'll be a few weeks until the launch of our brand new science podcast, which is going to be called The Uncertainty Principle. It's launching at the Perth Fringe Festival in February, February 8th, 10th, 14th, and 16th, I think, of the days. It's myself and another really, really cool scientist uh, from over east, and we're going to be talking about different stuff in each of the shows. It's at a bar called Rigby's Bar in Perth, so if you're interested in that, look up on the Fringe website, you'll find more details. There's other Curio stuff you can check out if you go to curionetwork.com. Not so much science related, but still a lot of fun if that's your thing. I'll post some links in the description. That sounds brilliant. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Right. So the books we've got this time, this is a Stephen Hawking special. Ben's got A Brief History of Time, which is the one that made Hawking famous. And I've got Hawking's last book that was in preparation at the time of his death. So nearly everyone's heard of A Brief History of Time. It's the one that made Hawking famous. Mm -hmm. uh, First book, I believe. It, it's certainly, I think it's certainly his first science communication yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'd, he'd <laughs> definitely written, written, yes. He'd written harder stuff before yeah, yeah, that. So yeah. that's why I was avoiding calling it his first book. Okay, fair enough. But, so it's his first book for the general public. Mm -hmm. So why have you chosen that as your book today? Okay, uh, well... Given that the main theme of this book is cosmology, which is the study of the universe and kind of the way it evolves and grows and moves around, as a dark matter scientist, it might not surprise you that that really interests me. But also, I find that the really cool thing about this book and Stephen Hawking's writing in general is, as anyone who's tried to communicate scientific concepts knows, I'm sure you're well acquainted mm. with this, there is a really difficult line to tread between mm dumbing down the science so much that you're not really being true to what's going on and making things far too technical for people to understand. And I think Stephen Hawking in this book puts on an absolute masterclass because it is, I mean, it's, it's totally written for the general public, but it is not dumbed down. It's, it's just really cleverly written. And I mean, it's, there's parts of it that even if you're a scientist, if you aren't familiar with it, you probably do have to read twice to be a bit like, oh, what oh, is yeah. that? And, but yeah, it, um, it's, it's yeah, just a masterclass in towing that line. I read it a few years ago and I found it absolutely fascinating. As a physicist, I have a, like you, I have a better background in this stuff than mm -hmm. the average member of the public. But I st there were some bits that, oh, I 
need to read that a second time to really understand it, but yeah. still, he does a brilliant job of it, trying to explain the science of black holes, singularities, cosmology, all that stuff. And he fa is famously said that he wanted to write this book without any equations except one. Yes, He's only exactly. got one equation, and that's mm -hmm. E equals MC squared. Indeed. It's an easy one to understand, and just a really famous one that he wanted to... Put yeah. in there. Apparently, I, I was reading some trivia about this. It was the publishers who basically convinced him. He originally had more equations in the mix, and they were like, oh. they were like, for every equation you put in there, the readership is going to halve. Oh. So he went through and was like, all right. And that, I mean, that, that's cool because he then had to find more clever ways to relate things, mm. you know, as opposed to just dropping an equation that a physicist might look at and go, oh, yeah, this explains what's going on here. He had to go, okay, I'll take that out and explain it in words so people can understand. Well, even for physicists, because you and I just sat through a conference yeah. last week <laughs> and I think oh you tell me but a lot of the other physicists in the room were sitting through the talks a uh, big long equation would go up on the screen and we think yep we're lost uh, yeah, we no, can't completely. clearly see that that equation shows such and such. I agree. I mean, communicating is hard, whether it's to the general public or even to other scientists from mm. within a niche field. And yeah, Stephen Hawking, just one of the best at it. Yeah. So I think the book is beautifully written. Yep. Um, really, really accessible. Um, One of my favorite things about it mm -hmm. is that it's called A Brief History of Time, which is true, but I think it is also really a history of the way humans have tried to understand yes. time and space and the universe in general. I mean, it starts talking about like Aristotle and Ptolemy, these ancient scientists kind of looking at like the stuff they could see and saying, oh, this must mean the earth is round and this must mean these things are moving and then, you know, sort of moving through history through the different models of cosmology. Mm. I enjoy the history of science, and because science is a human endeavor, I think having the history in there is an important part of understanding the science, understanding where we've come from, and mm -hmm. where we're going in the future. Yeah, I think it's really important in terms of if you want to think like a scientist and you want to be a better scientist, it's really important to see like what has been done historically, and there's sort of a, there's sort of a scientific mindset that has been established way 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 before we entered the game you know and i think this this book is a really good insight into not just the way scientists think throughout history but the way one of the greatest scientists of all time thinks about cosmology he's certainly one of the greatest scientists of all time unfortunately he's never going to win a nobel prize now they can't be awarded posthumously mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. would also actually need to discover hawking radiation <laughs> yes but so this book is now 30 years old it yep. was published in 1988 that's or right so. yeah so it's pretty much 30 years old this year uh, and in some ways a lot has changed since then and in some ways not much has yeah. changed so in terms of our overall understanding of cosmology exactly. a lot is the same we still think the big bang happened we still mm -hmm. think it happened for these reasons but the details have been ironed out yeah and a lot of the big questions that this book asks are still the big questions today mm. i mean we've learned a great deal in 30 years but things like you know what is the nature of dark matter how did the universe begin what is the grand unified theory i mean he, he, he touches a little bit on some of the these concepts in this book and they're still open questions today mm. some of the uh, a particular phrase might be out of date because we'll have sent up a satellite to measure a particular spectra since mm -hmm. then. But really, after 30 years, the book is still very up to date because yep. he was at the forefront of cosmology trying to understand the nature of the universe and ask the big questions. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing he got that book. It was brief as it is. Yeah. <laughs> and so That's that true. sort of leads into the next one. This is 30 years later. Yeah, right. So this book has a bit of a different genesis. Because mm -hmm. Hawking was so famous, he was possibly the world's most famous living scientist, probably mm -hmm. even still more famous than Brian Cox. <laughs> he was considered one of the smartest people in the world. People would ask him for his opinions on a variety of subjects. And so this book is not um, written fr fr uh, fresh from the start as A Brief History of Time is. This is a compilation of other stuff he'd written. So some of this has been reworked. This is taken from maybe magazine or uh, newspaper articles he'd done or bits he'd done for television and have been reworked or rewritten. But uh, very little of this material is entirely original. Mm -hmm. And it was compiled into a book that um, mostly runs smoothly together from chapter to chapter, but is sort of pretty separate. This is... A Brief History of Time starts with, uh, is 
a linear thing through the book. You start yeah. with Aristotle and so mm -hmm. forth, the ancient Greeks at the start of the book, and you work up to our modern, yeah, he's talking well, about string 30 years ago, but our modern understanding yeah, of physics. Yeah, yeah. This uh, is not like that, this jumps around. So this is brief answers to the big question. So Hawking had to play off his success. It's always brief something, <laughs> a f another brief history of time. Yeah, a, a briefer history a briefer of time. History of time. <laughs> brief answers to big questions. And these are big questions. These are things like, there's the science ones like what's inside a black hole, mm -hmm. is time travel possible? And again, but TLDR, we don't know what's inside a black hole. We don't know if time travel is possible other than the fact we're moving one second per Contrary second. Contrary right to now. what Christopher Nolan wants you to believe, if you've seen Interstellar. Ah. Uh, I was going to say, is that Interstellar? I don't remember. I've seen Interstellar. <laughs> they go in a black hole in that movie. But, that's true. <laughs> and then it gets weird. Yeah. I preferred it before the black hole part. But, <laughs> Then there's also the philosophical questions, like the first chapter is, is there a God? Um, and also the in-between questions, things like, will humans survive on Earth? Will artificial intelligence destroy us or outsmart us? How do we shape our future? How do we, do, do we need to colonize space? Do we go and need to colonize, need to go and colonize other planets and things like that? Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to the science, ones Hawking is very much in his element uh, and is able to write, uh, write about things like black holes and about the beginning of the universe and there is a noticeable update so mm. a lot of the science is still very similar to how it was 30 years ago but Hawking's uh, science's understanding of the nature of the universe has progressed in that time Hawking's understanding of his own work has progressed in that time, and he alludes to some of the stuff that was published after his death. Mm. Interesting. So some, some of the stuff he was working on right at the end. Because even in A Brief History of Time, he's talking about how he's starting to question the Big Bang model a bit, mm. which he sort of was one of the major proponents of, and yep. then he's sort of starting to no longer believe it's true, and I guess that's... He settled down. He's back to the Big Bang oh, model okay. here, but he, he <laughs> talks about the problems with the Big mm. Bang model. The, mm. The Big Bang model is extremely successful, uh, is one of the most successful scientific theories of all time. We predict that the universe uh, began in a certain way, and, and blah, blah, yep, blah. cosmic microwave background therefore has to have a certain spectrum. It does, things like that, but there are problems with it, things that it doesn't answer, or new questions that it throws up, and part of cosmology and the forefront of cosmology is do we, does that mean our model just needs a tweak or does it need to be thrown out mm. and a completely new idea comes in? He talks a bit about that. But overall, the book is, oh, and uh, with the philosophical ones, like, is there a God? Like, that one got a bit weird. Like mm. he said, science can't answer whether or not yeah. there's a God. But then he proceeds to spend the rest of the chapter trying to answer that from a scientific point of view anyway. Well, he's always been a bit philosophical. I mm. mean, it's, it's present in Brief History of Time as well, where he spends a lot of time talking about, like, the concept of knowledge for its own sake and you know it's a fundamental aspect of humanity to try and answer these big questions and they won't necessarily actually change our lives at all but it's worth doing anyway which is you know ultimately a philosophical point that's true and a lot of there's a lot of cases in science where something that was uh, just purely theoretical has come to have important yes. impact so things like general relativity it was our Einstein's theory, 100 years ago, purely theoretical, had no mm -hmm. applications whatsoever, but without it, GPS would not work. Things exactly. like that. So yeah, I actually kind of disagree with that point from Stephen mm. Hawking that he makes, where he, he does say, oh, you know, this stuff, this really deep understanding of the universe, it might never affect our lives, we should do it anyway. I think that is true, but I also think it will affect our lives, because it always does, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Every time we gain a, a new layer of understanding. Give it... A major discovery like Hawking's, give mm. it a few, a couple of decades, it will be important to our technology or our yeah. understanding of computing and mathematics and mm. things like that. Um, things like, uh, to understand how a black hole works or how the Big Bang works, he needs a better understanding of entropy. So basically thermodynamics and how thermodynamics works. And now that we're trying to develop quantum thermodynamic engines and things mm -hmm. like that, Equus is working on that sort of thing. <laughs> that understanding is going to be very important and could wind up as an important aspect of technology in mm. a few decades' time. So it's very pessimistic to say Hawking's work or the work of theoretical physicists and cosmologists yeah, yeah. isn't going to have any no, impact. Of but having said that, even if it doesn't, these are things we want to know. These yeah. are questions every, nearly every human has asked. It's fundamental to human nature to try and answer these things. And this is the point 
Hawking's trying to make there. Not, not that the work doesn't impact our lives, but that even if it doesn't, it should still be done. <laughs> this is why we love shows about history and about mm. astronomy and things like that. We want to know what's around us. We want to know mm. what's out there and where we've come from. Exactly. And when was this book published, by the way? This book was published this year. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Um, so, in the middle of working on it at the time of his depth, uh, death. So, yep, published this year. Wow. So, this is not exactly hot off the press. It's been out mm -hmm. a few months. Uh, oh, I say this year. By the time you're watching this, it'll be <laughs> just barely last year. Yes. Happy 2019, so everyone. Happy New Year. 2018. Right. So, 30 years after that one. Great. And it's interesting to see the difference. Personally, I don't think this book is quite as well written. It's, I didn't feel the writing flowed quite as well. It wasn't quite as captivating. Um, it just wasn't that quite as compelling. And because of the each chapter is really a separate thing, sometimes it alludes to a previous chapter, but it's relatively disjointed. And I think mm. that is because these are older articles, uh, stuff he's written before that has been redone to work it into a single book. Mm -hmm. So, if I, I would certainly read A Brief History of Time again. I'm probably going to go back and read that. This one, I finished it recently, but I probably wouldn't go back and read this one. Mm. Uh, there is new stuff. So, as I said, he alludes to his most recent work. And so, if you read A Brief History of Time and then this one, you can see the new understanding he's got over the past 30 years. And that's mm -hmm. interesting to see. But overall, I much prefer A Brief History of Time. Well, there you go. I haven't read this one yet, but I'll definitely pick it up. It's definitely worth a read. It's just... Um, Brief History I mean, of like, Time is one I will reread. It's this right there on the cover. Not. The phenomenal international bestseller. You, yeah. can't, you can't go past. It's <laughs> a rare genius. <laughs> and an even rarer now. Mm, yeah. No, that was... Sadly. Worked. That got dark. Mm. Anyway, Ben, thank you very much for joining Thanks me. Thanks for having me. We'll see you next time.